Ever since we started riding motorcycles, Jacob and I had a dream of crossing the country on them. At this period in our lives, we don't have a lot of money, but we still decided to do what we could to achieve our dream. The plan seemed simple enough. Buy two motorcycles for cheap in North Carolina, ride them to California, and try to sell them to recoup the costs of our trip. We planned our trip as such. Rutherford to Nashville through the Tale of the Dragon, Nashville to Little Rock through Memphis, Little Rock to Dallas through Hot Springs National Park, Dallas to Clovis through Wichita Falls, Clovis to Duncan through White Sands National Park, Duncan to Phoenix through Highway 191, Phoenix to Vegas through Hoover Dam, Vegas to Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara to the Bay Area, and finally, the Bay Area to Sacramento. Surely nothing could go wrong, right? Wrong! The first bike we picked up was a 1982 Honda CB900 Custom. I bought it in Georgia during my time at AmeriCorps, and rode it two hours to Jacob's Place in North Carolina. The second bike was a 1988 Kawasaki Concourse, which Jacob bought locally. As months passed closer to the start of our trip, Jacob carried us by doing maintenance himself on the two bikes, while all I could do was send him money on PayPal as I traveled around in AmeriCorps. A few more months passed, and I finally took my flight and arrived in Charlotte, where Jacob drove us to Rutherfordton. We spent the first part of the day doing last minute checks on both bikes, including installing a speedometer cable on the CB900 and gluing a fairing on the concourse. We took off for Asheville for Jacob's apartment for a test run, and it was a good thing we did because the CB900 broke down on the way. The first time, we figured maybe the battery was bad and swapped it for our spare. Everything was going smoothly until it died again only 5 miles from the apartment, and that's where we knew it had to be the stator or the regulator. We called Mountain Cycle Works who were able to get us both parts by the next day, which was great news, but now we needed to tow the bike. So Jacob remembered that he had AAA and tried to call them, but was informed that his account was canceled. When he got it opened up again, they told him we can't get a tow until tomorrow. So our two options were for us to either pay a local shop to tow it, or have Jacob go all the way back to Rutherfordton with the concourse and load it up on his truck Dusty, an old Toyota pickup. We went with the latter. Jacob promised me he'd come as fast as he can and peeled off at 6.30 while I sat on the side of the road. It was fine. I just watched YouTube videos on my phone until he came back, but I did have two state trooper incidents. The first one, he was just checking in on me, but the second one, they came flying in because they had reports of an injured body. So I apologized profusely and repositioned myself to look a little more alive. Jacob came back at 9, we unloaded the concourse, loaded the CB900, and rode the few minutes to his apartment. We settled in the house, went for some pizza and beer, and prayed for a better tomorrow. We woke up with nothing but time to kill until the 4.30 estimate for the parts to arrive, so we checked out the CB900 one more time before we headed into downtown Asheville for Jacob to give me a tour. Jacob found the plug for the stator had melted and two of the contacts were touching, so we felt a lot more reassured that the stator was the issue. Downtown, Jacob showed me his campus, we went to an antique store, then finished with a small bite at a cafe he used to work at. When we came home, we impatiently waited for the phone call, and at 5, we finally heard that the parts were ready for us and to come on down. Jody was so kind and hospitable, and helped us install the stator and regulator at Mountain Cycle Works just outside of Asheville. He lent us an 8mm socket that we didn't have, a flashlight, and even check the battery voltage once we installed both parts. Even when Jacob forgot some internal bolts on the stator, Jody once again let us borrow the 8mm for the bolts that were dangerously close to stripping at this point. With everything working on the CB900, we went to Ace for a missing bolt on the chrome airbox trim, installed it, and went back to the apartment to relax and get a full night's rest before our first major day. We started our day with a hearty breakfast Jacob cooked us, and went to pack the motorcycles. Luckily, the stator and regulator replacement did the job, and the CB900 had no issues starting and idling now. We took off with some gas, and started to head to the tail of the dragon. Alright, that was the first hundred miles, Jacob. How you feeling? Sore. <laughs> Me too, this is, this is gonna be a rough one, that's for sure. <sighs>
as we approached it, it heavily reminded us of Alice's in the Bay Area, except with a DJ this time. Some rain started to sprinkle, so we darted inside the gift shop as it built up and looked around as we waited for the shower to end. Once it ended, we hopped back on our bikes and rode through the tail. Carefully, unfortunately, since the roads were slick and we definitely didn't want to push the bikes too hard. When we ended at the top of the tail and got on a back road to the main interstate, a massive downpour of rain began that soaked through our clothes. We were thankful enough that it was after the steep curves of the tail. Sunshine came afterwards and quickly dried us up as we pulled into a gas station to rest up. We ordered an Airbnb for the night in Lebanon, just 30 minutes east of Nashville, and pushed the last three hours through. Everything was going great, and the bikes were fantastic, until just three miles outside of our Airbnb, I turned the ignition off on the CB900, and that was it for it. When I tried to turn it on again, nothing happened. We tried to put a jump pack to the battery, still nothing. So we figured that the already slightly faulty ignition had finally given out. We scratched our heads wondering what our next move will be. Suddenly, another motorcyclist stopped by us to ask if we were all right. He introduced himself as Bobby. After we explained what happened, Bobby was kind enough to give us a tow the last three miles to our Airbnb and went to go pick up his truck and trailer just down the road. We thanked him immensely as we unloaded the bike at the Airbnb parking lot. He told us there is a motorcycle parts store that might be able to help us out. We dropped our stuff off, introduced ourselves to the host, who is Caveman Gaming on Twitch, by the way. Go show him some love. Their kitties went to go get food, then removed the ignition from the CB900. Jacob looked up a wiring diagram of how we can hotwire the bike, and we went to bed with two plans. One for a shop with a hopeful replacement ignition, and one for a last resort hotwire. Our alarm rang at 7.30 in the morning, 30 minutes before the motorcycle parts store Bobby told us about would open. We got ready, gave them a call at 8, and were faced with the expected news that they did not have a 40-year-old ignition in stock, and they were the only motorcycle parts store in Lebanon. Hotwire it is. Luckily, we kept the old stator, so we snipped two wires out of it, followed the wiring diagram Jacob found, and fired the bike up no problem. Thank God. A gentle rain came and went as we packed our bags on the bike, and we took off for Memphis. The trip was going smoothly with Jacob in the front and me in the back, when suddenly a bungee cord flew off of Jacob's bike towards me. I dodged the cord and alerted Jacob immediately to pull over, which he did carefully, being mindful of the bag with no strap. Turns out it was my backpack with my laptop and other important belongings, so we were happy it didn't fall off. Jacob put the backpack on and we carried forward. We stopped at a Love's for gas and Jacob pulled the wires out of the blue bike's ignition to turn it off. It was troublesome to get the wires back in and keep them stable, so we butchered the old rectifier's plug, which matched the ignition plug for the pins to create a hot wire key per se with the pins. It worked perfect and stayed stable, so we were pumped and got back on the road. Pushing towards Memphis was rough because the heat started to pick up, and downtown seemed to never come, irregardless of the signs welcoming us. Once we approached, we were welcomed with the famous giant Bass Pro Shops Pyramid, and I demanded Jacob to take the next exit so we could look at it. I had no idea it was in Memphis. We didn't even go inside, we just found a shady spot by the pyramid, admired it, and recharged and cooled off before getting back on the bikes. By complete coincidence, we had no idea the Bass Pro Shops. The whole pyramid. The whole pyramid was in Memphis. Bikes are doing great. Lying down has never felt so good. <laughs> Incredible. We were in the mood for a buffet style lunch, so we put in directions for a Vietnamese one and took off. It was so hot and the streets were so terrible that we were relieved to get there, only to face a sign stating carry out only. We got back on the bikes, I almost lost control due to how bad the road was and the railroad tracks mixed into it, the traffic, the heat, but recovered thankfully. We crossed the Mississippi to West Memphis, Arkansas and stopped at a Chinese buffet that was really questionable, but food is food. 
We ate our food and ordered our Airbnb in Mayflower, which was 30 minutes outside of Little Rock, and Jacob made a suggestion that we take the 30 minute longer route to break the monotony of the interstate. I was hesitant at first, but agreed, and I was so glad that I did. It was so much more relaxing and had more opportunities for flow states that we decided we should try to avoid highways as much as possible moving forwards. Just a couple minutes outside of our place for the night, Jacob took a corner too fast and had to emergency brake. Time slowed as I watched his bike lock up and wiggle into the dirt, but thank God he was okay and the bike didn't go down either. We stopped, breathed, and laughed about how the day was too perfect for nothing to have happened. The place we stayed at was gorgeous to say the least. It was very old money and the hosts welcomed us with open arms and informed us that the hot tub was all heated up. We soaked, it's relaxed, so took a nice shower in the Victorian looking tub and got in bed squeaky clean. I woke up to a beautiful view of the green mountains of Arkansas and Jacob had already been up because I kept him up from snoring. Sorry, Jacob. We packed up as usual and took off on some back roads since we loved them so much from the day before. The speedometer on the CB900 was worrying so we decided we should get some WD-40 for it. We stopped at a Walmart for food, some medicine, and the WD-40. And this Walmart, oddly enough, had the grooviest music playing. We looped up the speedo cable and kept cruising towards hot springs, but it only made things worse. It wobbled so much that the needle fell off. We figured, screw it, and just unplugged the cable and carried on. Who needs to know how fast they're going anyways? Getting into hot springs was a nightmare. It was so packed with traffic and hot that the bikes did not like it. The CB900 even started to make a knocking noise. Luckily, we pushed to a nice, cool, covered garage and let them rest as we grabbed lunch and explored hot springs. Returning to the bikes, the knocking noise was thankfully gone. We ordered an Airbnb a bit north of Dallas and started moving there. We were pleasantly surprised that our route went through Oklahoma and we could check off an additional state on our journey. There were no helmet laws in Arkansas and Oklahoma, so Jacob tried riding with no helmet. He regretted it after 40 miles of painful wind noise to the ears. A couple miles outside of Paris, Texas, Jacob told me on the intercom to pull over because his bike felt wobbly. Unfortunately, his rear tire went flat on a Sunday with nobody open, the day before Memorial Day. Melissa pulled over to check in on us as we waited for the tow truck. She said she's part of the Christian Motorcycle Association and promptly started calling everyone she knew to see if anyone can swap her tire tomorrow so we can get back on the road. We exchanged numbers too so she could keep us updated if she learns anything, and she waited with us until the tow truck came. As we loaded the first bike up, in a horrible series of events, we went to start the second bike and it wouldn't start. Our usual trick with the hot wire wasn't working anymore. The tow truck driver left with the concourse and all of our bags to get more straps to tow the CB900 too. You could call this our lowest point. While we waited, we re-motivated each other and discovered the issue was the main fuse which had popped. We were pretty sure it was because one of the pins from the hot wire grounded itself on the metal of the bike since it was so windy. We were lazy and didn't fully remove our so-called key. The tow truck drive home was entertaining, with the driver telling us all his stories of being our age and doing dumb stuff with his share of motorcycles and cars. Before we went to bed, we sat down and formulated a plan. This night ended terribly, and we needed to fight out of it, so we planned and planned and planned. O'Reilly's opened at 7.30, so since we were out two vehicles and it was only a mile away, we walked there. Thankfully, they had generic fuses so we grabbed some 30 and 40 amp fuses, breakfast, and walked back to our Airbnb. We wired the 30 amp fuse into the CB900 and it started right up. We hugged and celebrated that it was a simple fix. And for the first time, we had to split up. I got on the CB900 and rode into Dallas towards a cycle gear I called the night before that had the tire in stock we needed. And Jacob waited for the tow truck. I bought the tire, secured to the bike with bungee cords, and headed west into Fort Worth towards the only mechanic that could take us in today. 
While I was doing that, apparently AAA canceled the tow without informing Jacob, and he found it eventually when he wasn't getting me any updates. Thanks, AAA. He ordered a private tow company and gave me a call that he's still on his way. Eventually, the tow showed up at the shop and the mechanic got right to fixing the bike. He was super quick and a great price. We we're very thankful for his work. It was only 1 p.m. at this point, so we talked and agreed that we could still move six hours today and make great time on our trip. We both decided after getting so emotionally drained from previous events that our new priority was to get to California as quickly as possible. We dished the rest of our planned route, saddled up, and got on I-20 and headed west. We just kept going and going, watching the scenery change from trees to desert. We pulled over at a gas station, ate some food, filled up, and decided to pump up the tires. We paid the price for the air pump and deflated the tires trying to get on the nozzle, to which our unfortunate luck did not even turn on. So now we're stuck with low tire pressure and no pump in the middle of nowhere. But not even 10 seconds later, a fellow biker pulled up and brought out a portable pump to pump our tires. The more we continued on this trip, the more we learned how much the biker community helps each other out. We kept moving until the evening and decided to cut our trip 70 miles short when it became pretty dark. We stopped at a motel in Odessa and right outside of it, there was an odd moment where the CB900 wouldn't recognize neutral, but the transmission would. So we had to bump start it, but it recognized it fine after that. Maybe a fluke, we thought. Since we were just off of I-20, we started the day early and just got right back on. The neutral light was still off, so we had to bump start the CB900. Not a big deal, but it definitely was inconvenient. We stopped for breakfast and got right back on and kept pushing until El Paso, which felt like forever. Texas is massive, but there are beautiful mesas on the way. In El Paso, we got off close to downtown and found a shady tree we recollected ourselves under. The last couple days we've been smelling sulfur and assumed that's just what Texas smells like, but we started to suspect it was one of the bikes. We stuck our faces in and sure enough, the CB900 smelled like sulfur. A quick search led to the conclusion that sulfur smell is gear oil, so after some great Mexican food, we headed for AutoZone to change the gear oil on both bikes just to be safe. The employees were really helpful and gave us empty bottles and paper towels to help change it in the parking lot. The gear oil didn't look too bad, but there was a noticeable difference with the new oil in. We got back on the bikes and back on the interstate. This whole day has just been interstate riding, not a single side road which was opposite of how we wanted it. But at this point, as we said, we were just trying to get to California as fast as possible, and there aren't many options in the desert either. We kept pushing until the sunset and stopped in Wilcox, Arizona for the night and treated ourselves with a hotel with breakfast this time. Breakfast was a letdown. It was just cereal and milk, but we counted our blessings and filled up on cereal in the morning. We hopped on I-10 this time and started our first leg of the trip to Tucson. In Tucson, we realized that since it was still morning and it was getting so hot, it was only going to get much worse. When we pulled over for gas, we took off our leather jackets, lathered ourselves in sunscreen, and got back onto I-10. Merging onto I-8 heading to Yuma, the heat was brutal. The beautiful cacti surrounded us as we traveled on a straight road, watching the heat wave reflections bounce off the interstate. We would pull over and reapply sunscreen, but it felt like it barely did anything. No matter how much you applied, the brutal sun would burn through. Miserable and most likely dehydrated, we got into Yuma for lunch. Waiting at red lights in Yuma was like sitting in an oven, and when we finally stopped for lunch, we drank so much water and rested for a good while until we finally felt fine to go again. Crossing the border into California had a beautiful view of sand dunes, and as we climbed into the mountains and the sun went down, we were blessed with cool weather against our sunburnt skins. Night fell as we approached San Diego, and we stopped at our good friend Tenchi's apartment for the evening. Hours flew by as we spent time together and caught each other up about life in our own little worlds. We slept in because we had the shortest day of the trip, only San Diego to Isla Vista. When we were all up, we went for breakfast and took our time before leaving. 
We let Tenshi warm up the bikes a bit and took off. Since we were in California now, thankfully we were able to lane split, which was especially great for the CB900 since it's air cooled and there was a lot of LA traffic as expected. It felt great to pass it as we carried on. Seeing the ocean as we rode up Highway 101 was breathtaking, and we now knew that we were so close to the finish. Time flew by, and we quickly got to our exit in Isla Vista. We showed up at my cousin Nazar's place, who was kind enough to host us. We timed it perfectly with a mock graduation party and applauded as the fake diplomas were passed out to the graduates. Day turned to night as we spent time with yet another great friend of ours. Our final day. We couldn't believe that we've made it so far. Nazar was kind enough to make us a delicious breakfast. We had some coffee to the views of the ocean and promptly left since we were eager to get home. We took Highway 101 up to King City, then back roads to Santanella on I-5, then straight to Sacramento. The time riding was spent reflecting on how our trip went, and we only stopped for gas and a quick lunch, so it felt very, very quick to get to Sacramento. When we finally made it, we embraced each other in joy and awe that these 80s motorcycles made it across the country. No more do we have to live in the looming feeling that something will go wrong. A home-cooked meal waited for us, which is just what we needed after all of this stress. Checking off a proud accomplishment off of our lists, we could confidently say that we rode motorcycles across the country. If we were to do it again, newer and more reliable motorcycles would be the move, but where's the fun in that? We thought about what more we could have brought with us, and we concluded that a camelback with water would have been a lifesaver, and foot pegs for a more comfortable riding position, and an 8mm socket too, so we wouldn't have to borrow one. The U.S. is such a vast and beautiful country, and we were fortunate enough to have kind people feeling inspired by our journey and helping us on our way through. I apologize that there isn't much more good footage. It's a little hard to film on a motorcycle. Perhaps the next trip will be different. <laughs>